So without further ado, I suppose we should get started. Today, we are talking about the second key element in common sense economics, and that is opportunity cost, or the, uh, I guess the section is titled, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And this is the, the, the phrase that economists use to describe opportunity costs. The idea that no matter what you do, even if you're not paying for a lunch, it's still not free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. It's all a myth. It's made up. It's made up by big lunch in order to get people to go eat lunch because they think it's free. Maybe not that much. So, again, this is the second key element, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch, meaning that even if you get to eat for free, it doesn't mean that someone isn't paying for it, right? I know growing up, I was on a... I may have been on free lunch for a little bit, but I know I was on reduced lunch for uh, for a while, and I think there was a period that my mom started making just a little bit too much money, which disqualified us, and I didn't get reduced lunch anymore. Dang. Oh, well. Single-parent households, sometimes they... Uh, they make a dollar more than they're supposed to, which means that they have to then, uh, you know, pay for lunch. Anyways, um, why is this? Why is there no such thing as a free lunch? Well, it's because of this thing called scarcity, right? Nothing's free. Everything costs something, right? And uh, that's because there's this cost that we don't think about. That's, as I've alluded to, opportunity cost. So most people, they think... Of, uh, of scarcity as there only being a limited amount of something, right? And I remember, you know, yesterday we talked about, you know, thinking something that's not scarce. Uh, people said air, as New York is right now. Some people said, uh, some people said that, uh, you know, space wasn't limited. And I, you know, I talked about that and I said, okay, well, even if space is unlimited, it's still scarce, right? And that you can't have this space that I'm occupying because I'm here right now. You know, space is unlimited. This space is still scarce because I'm using it. <laughs> uh, this is actually the second lecture. Uh, Stalin, but you're, you're welcome to be here, dude. Good to see you. Um, first one was on Tuesday. So, so fair enough. Fair enough. So, scarcity is not just the amount of something existing, right? It's not just there being a, a small amount. It's also that things have more than one valuable use, okay? So, space is limited. This pasture here in the whole entire planet, or even you could look at this as the whole entire universe, right? It's all scarce because there's more than one thing that you can be doing with any one resource, be it space, be it uh, something that comes from space, you know, be it something that comes from the land, right? Be it some sort of natural resource, be it some, some sort of labor, uh, be anything. It has more than one natural, it has more than one valuable use and a lot of resources, I would dare I say most, you know, most resources are very limited, right? And that some are very limited, and some of them are limited, but uh, you know, the, the more of them you use, then you have to start using resources that you, eh, you'd probably not want to, right? So everything is affected by scarcity, okay? This is where things get really fun, okay? Because both of these things are scarce. Both of these things are scarce. They're both water, right? That's nice, but this whole lake of water, I'm assuming it's a lake, looks like it's a, uh, I don't know, Kind of reminds me of uh, uh, the Great Lakes, right? Indiana Dunes kind of vibe I get from this. And then you have the, the water bottle, right? A good old bottle of water, just chilling there. Both of these things are scarce. Well, you know, why is that whole lake scarce? Why is that? Why is there scarcity involved in that whole lake? What makes that that water scarce? Well, we can see that there's some people out there swimming around and I guess that means if they're swimming around what does that mean well we can't then use it for other things right we can't use that water for fishing now right I can't well I mean I, I could go fish there they probably wouldn't be too happy with it though right we can't use it for fishing uh can we use it for you know tubing that probably wouldn't be the best either, right? You gotta imagine if someone's out there fishing, you know, they're throwing out their fishing line and then oh, they get caught on somebody. That's probably not the, the, the best sight ever. And, uh, you know, you if I were to, uh, you know, to, to, to take the speedboat through there while I'm tubing, you know, they probably wouldn't you know, be underwater. They come up and just get hit in the side of the face. That's probably not the best situation, you know, there either. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as you said, I mean, this water, 
uh, it, it's not drinkable in its current state, but we could set up a you know a huge filtration system here, and we could pump the water out. Matter of fact, I think Nestle does pump water out of the Great Lakes, right? So it's not drinkable in its current state. I mean, maybe maybe you could drink it. Probably not the best idea to, <laughs> but uh, you certainly could. Okay. Um, but the, you know, if we use this water for one thing, we can't use it for another. Okay. A matter of fact, I brought up Indiana Dunes. If you actually go to Indiana Dunes, you can swim in that water, but you know, a lot of people they're not they're not all about it because you can see on the horizon there's actually some some factories. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know what they make, and I don't even know if they, I'm assuming they don't even pollute the water, but it still kind of turns people off. But you look over here at this water. This water is very very small. We can tell that that one's scarce, right? That one's the easy one, right? You say, oh well, you're in a desert, of course, right? That's that's uh, it's limited in the fact that you know there's not much of it around, right? There's not much of it around in that uh, there's a lot of people wanting it maybe as well. It, it's 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 relative scarcity is, is incredibly higher because uh, there's a lot of people wanting it and there's not much of it, right? But you know there could also be multiple uses, right? Ask uh, ask people that have been in the military that have served overseas what they've had to do with a bottle of water, right? It's not just drinking for them; they also have to be able to be able to shower themselves with a very very small amount of water, right? So it's also for cleaning, right? Uh, I can't imagine having to decide between needing to use a bottle of water to drink and using a bo uh, using a bottle of water to uh, to bathe yourself, right? Um, it's scarce, right? And I, and I can imagine if you're one of those military individuals that has to you know clean yourself with nothing but a, a bottle of, a bottle of water, um, man, <laughs> you're gonna whew, you're gonna be feeling the scarcity there, yeah. I know there's yeah there's uh you know there MREs. They, uh, they can use water in all sorts of different ways. Okay, so scarcity is two parts, okay? It's limited resources, right? It's a limited amount, okay? And there's also uh, there being multiple uses, right? So it's two things, okay? So it's, it's this whole idea of there being a limited resources versus unlimited wants, right? The wants of society are unlimited, the resources of society are very limited, and there are multiple uses, okay? So we have scarcity. It exists, we can't do anything about it, as in we can't remove it, I should say, but we can do things to make it easier, right? If you were to look at the scarcity, the relative scarcity of food, uh, you know, throughout history compared to today, you would see that today food is relatively less scarce, right? And because of that, you've seen, you know, population increase dramatically, right? So we, we, can, we can do things to alleviate scarcity, but we can't exactly just pretend it doesn't exist, right? So what's free then? You get free Wi-Fi. Is that free? I mean, you go to you go to McDonald's and and you uh, you you get the free Wi-Fi. Okay. I mean, how are you exactly paying for that? You, we can't imagine like you know them providing the free Wi-Fi. What does that cost you? You know, if they're getting internet for the store, you know, maybe they have to buy more broadband for for customers to be on their free Wi-Fi. Maybe they have to pay extra security for them to offer that because you know they probably don't want to get hacked. Uh, through the network that they offer the free Wi-Fi through, okay? So you're, you're paying for it in the higher cost of your McNuggets, right? What about these free samples? They give these away, right? And, and by the way, even if you didn't pay, even if you weren't paying extra in your McNuggets, it's still not free because they're paying for it, right? Let's say you go get some free samples, okay? Let's say you go get some free samples. You're at, uh, you know, you're at a mall. Maybe you're not at a mall. COVID's going around, you know. Maybe you're not at a mall. But uh, let's say you are, right? And you're getting free samples. You may, not, you may not be paying for it, but someone is. Whether it's you and you eat that free sample and it's really good, so then you buy it, well, maybe you're paying a higher price because they give out free samples to people that don't buy, right? Yeah, there's always a cost to things. Absolutely. Sloth, Neuros... Stalin, you guys all get this. You guys all get it, right? Uh, and the thing is, let's, you, you can definitely see how there'd be a cost if a company's giving out free samples and no one buys their product, right? You can definitely see how there's a cost there, right? And, and I was with Sloth until he said air is free. Rest in peace, me. Oh, well. When you uh, buy one, get one free... This is, this is the one that I love to pick apart with my wife, right? She loves buying things on sale. Oh, it was on sale. I had to buy it. It's like, well, 
hold on. You know, A, if you if you, if if it wasn't on sale, we would have saved money then because he would not have bought it, meaning that we would have ended up ahead. <laughs> That's one thing I like to point out. Another thing I like to point out is that okay, what's happening here? Well, really, they're they're just making it the, the the price is really just half of whatever the listing price is, right? If it's buy one get one free for ten dollars, then the price is five dollars each, right? You can say it's free. People like getting free stuff, right? It's the art of marketing. Make it seem like you know what you're offering is is the best thing possible, right? At least this is kind of. You know, this one's kind of honest, right? Buy, you know, free stuff when you buy other stuff. Of course, the the other stuff that you're buying is most likely some of the stuff you're getting free. So then, yeah, you know, do the math yourself. Okay. If something were to be truly free, it wouldn't cost anyone anything. And the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, is that everything costs somebody something. I think the closest that we can get to something being truly free, the closest that we can get to something being truly free is, uh, is kind of information, right? Or, or knowledge, I, could, I should say. Harnessing the information, that's not free at all, right? I mean, you know plenty of companies, they, they harvest data and uh, you know, they, they are able to sell it to people, right? So we know, you know harvesting the, the information is, isn't isn't quite free, but you know, um, it, it's it's the cheapest thing I should say. It's not free, but it's it's one of the cheapest things, yeah. You know, which is amazing, and that's why we've seen so much wealth here within the you know last twenty years is because we've been able to gather information and data so easily, right? America isn't not that kind of free. I'm talking as a cost, not freedom wise. Come on, Stalin. All right, so if something were to be truly free, it wouldn't cost anyone anything. And we know that everything costs somebody something, okay? Everything costs somebody something. If you're not paying for it, someone is. If you're not sacrificing resources for something, somebody else is, right? Whenever you make a choice, you're sacrificing. To choose is to refuse, yeah? And, and why do we have to choose? Well, because of scarcity right when we're looking at water do we want to swim in it do we want to drink it do we want to fish in it do we want to go tubing we made a choice right we made a choice because we had to because we can't have it all it's because of scarcity we make choices so folks really if we didn't have scarcity we would not have economics if we if we didn't if scarcity did not exist if the laws of our universe were entirely different that you could do whatever you want uh, simultaneously in that there there was an unlimited amount of everything, then yeah, there wouldn't be scarcity and you wouldn't have to make choices and I wouldn't be here talking to you over the internet about this thing called economics, right? We have to do only one thing or we have to do a limited amount of things. We, we can't have everything that we want, right? And that's scarcity because we have scarcity, we have to make choices because we make choices. We have something to study in economics. Thank goodness. I like being employed. Oh, well. Tin Stoffel. There is no such thing as a free lunch. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Okay. And uh, that's opportunity cost, okay? Again, we're choosing, right? We're choosing because of scarcity, right? So let's do this. Uh, I can. I think I can make a poll. I just have to. I just have to figure out how. Chat settings. Uh, da 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 ba boo boo. See, I, I don't know. I can't. I can't remember how to do a straw poll in chat. Just use the website. Yeah, let's do that. Ba doop boop boo doop boo straw pull. Let's see here. Favorite candy. All right, chat. What are some candy bars that you want? I'll put in my own. I'll put in Reese's. What are some other candy bars? What are some other candy bars that uh, that you think are top notch? What do we got? 
Kit Kat, very nice. Very nice cookie candy. Twix, also a very nice option. Very solid. Left or right Twix? Eh, it doesn't matter. We'll just put Twix. Ooh, Heath. Classic. All right, and I think that'll, that'll do us. Okay. So now... The, the left specifically says sloth. Uh, we'll create this poll. Get out of here, Nintendo. And then I need to share this. Share this URL. Right here. There's the straw poll. You guys can go vote on this. I'm not gonna vote on mine just because you know I'm being I'm being honest. Okay. Let's put this back over here. And I, I, you know, it's it's always best to do a blind, a blind vote. That way people can't, uh, hmm, what am I, what am I saying here? That way people can't, uh, you know, just oh, that one's winning. I better go with that one, right? We got to make sure that we're being, uh, that we're having an honest poll here, not being manipulated in any way. So once the results are in, I'll go ahead and bring it back up. Uh oh, wait, I asked you guys all your favorites, and of course, okay, so I'm gonna. <laughs> That's such a dumb move. I asked everyone their favorite, and everyone said the same thing. So we're going to get results that are all the same thing. I'm such a silly person. Okay. So how about this? I'm going to flip a coin. Do I have a coin? I think the nearest thing I have are die. Yeah. Let me grab that real quick. Yeah. Well, hey, guys. What's your favorite? And then uh, here you guys go, putting, you know, all different things. It's okay. I have some die here. That was quite possibly one of the silliest things that I've done. Okay, so we have, I think, three different colors. So if it is this mint color, we're gonna say that's a Kit Kat. If it's red, we're gonna say that's Twix. And if it's green, we are going to say that it's Heath. Okay, that's the one that we're gonna choose. Okay. So if I were to roll this, okay, it's mint, so that's Kit Kat. And you guys were all given a Kit Kat. Or you all chose the Kit Kat, we'll say, just to make the example work a little bit better. Then what would your opportunity cost me? Well, it'd be different for each of you, right? It'd be different for each of you. Um, you know, for uh, for you, Stalin, your opportunity cost would be whatever the, the, the second one that you liked the most. I don't know, you know, if that's... Uh, whether that's Heath or, uh, here, let me put the results up here. Whether that was Heath or, or Twix or even Reese's, you know, that's, that's, that's for you to decide. Okay. For Reese's, the opportunity cost is the Reese's. Now for, uh, for you, Sloth, you said that your favorite was the Twix, right? So if you got the Kit Kat, then your opportunity cost, you know, because I could have gotten that other one instead, your opportunity cost is the Twix, right? Because you got the, the other thing, right? So the next best thing you could have gotten was the Twix. Right, and uh, for for you, Nura, because I uh, you know I got that Kit Kat, I could have gotten a Heath Bar instead. So your opportunity cost is the Heath Bar. Okay, so that is opportunity cost, right? Your opportunity cost is the thing you give up, right? The thing you give up, yeah. So it's not all of them. It's not all of them, right? That's an important distinction to make, right? Because it's the Kit Kat, it's not the Reese's and the 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 Twix bar and the Heath, right? It's just the next best thing that you would have liked. Okay, it's not all of it. It's just the next best thing. Okay. So, let's do this. Let's uh, let's work on a little schedule. Can you knock it off? My cats are just fighting each other for no apparent reason. I don't know why, but they are, I guess. Okay. Uh, let's bring up Notepad. So from 5 a.m. to, I don't know, let's say it's a, oh, this is a perfect example. I'm going back to school, right? Right? So I, uh, I, I had a summer where I could do anything I wanted from 5 to, uh, I don't know, 6 o'clock when my wife gets home, we'll say. So let's make a schedule. Uh, only till six when she gets home. Okay. 
So at five o'clock, what would I have been doing at five o'clock previously? Well, is this zoomed in enough? Probably not. Let's see here. Let's bring this back down. Man, I am bad at this. That is definitely not big enough. What do you think, Chad? Do I need to make it bigger? Because, well, if I make it bigger, it doesn't make the text bigger. Should I go into uh, a, a, a Google Doc? We think. Hmm. I think we're going to go into a Google Doc. Let's do that. We're going to copy and paste this into a Google Doc. There's that. Let me come up here and we're going to hit, eh, say 24. Yeah, there we go. So at five o'clock in the morning, you know what I would have been doing? Sleeping. And we probably would have done that for, oh, I don't know. It's summertime. I can be irresponsible. We'll say uh, all the way through nine o'clock and then at 10 o'clock we would wake up, right? Then at 10 o'clock, we would wake up, right? And then at 10 o'clock, we would, uh, you know, we'd start scuttle button around. At that point, you know, we'd wake up. Uh, we, you know, uh, get ready for the day, you know, brush teeth. Uh, make sure I smell decent. <laughs> oh, drink coffee. Uh, that's important. Uh, breakfast, maybe. Okay. And then at 11, let's see here, at 11 o'clock, um, we'll say uh, 11 till 1. It's probably playing games. So playing games. And that's all the way up through 1. And then at 1, from 1 to 4, you know, I, I don't know how many hours of yard work I'd have to do. But, uh, but you know, I, I would say at least a couple of just, like, you know, doing stuff around the house. Whether it's dishes, cat boxes, making stuff. At least a couple hours of that. Why drink coffee when you can drink a venti cup of espresso from Starbucks? Oh my gosh. I, I'm i not the biggest fan of Starbucks. I'm not going to lie. I think it's just overpriced coffee. Okay. And then... You guys know what I'm doing at, uh, you know, starting at four, you know, from four to six, right? So it, it, on the, from four o'clock to five, I'm, uh, you know, streaming, right? Got my lectures I'm giving. Yeah. I'm streaming at, uh, at three o'clock. Um, man, I don't know. I'm just going to say uh, for the short term, you know, unwind games, maybe. We'll say, and then at six o'clock, I said this when my wife gets home. So hang out with wife slash dinner and that's what I would do the rest of the day okay so this is one schedule but what if I have school oh my gosh I have school well now you know now this changes to okay that's still sleep thank goodness okay well now at six o'clock at six o'clock I have to wake up get ready drink coffee breakfast uh-oh uh-oh and now oh no it gets worse Oh no, it gets worse. I don't have to be working until 7.15, but I'm in there at seven anyway, so this this still works. Okay, works, ah, I see what I did there. Oh my Lanta. Guys, guys. Okay, this one's, this is, I get off at, you know, 3.15, so yeah, we'll say we're good. What? This is still gonna be unwinding games. This is still gonna be streaming. This is still gonna be hanging out with like, oh my goodness. Guys, what is my opportunity cost of doing work? Is my opportunity cost of doing work just stuff around the house and dishes? Is this my only opportunity cost? Is this it? Is this the only opportunity cost I have? Stuff around the house? No. My opportunity cost is all this. <laughs> That's my opportunity cost of working, right? I, I, I'm giving up sleep, okay? 
I'm giving up. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still waking up. I, I will say, how about this? This is not an opportunity cost. Let's highlight this in uh, in let's highlight it. Sorry, in orange. That's not an opportunity cost. Why is that? Why is this not an opportunity cost? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Why is this not part of my opportunity cost? Any ideas? So we may be chat, you know, uh, typing out if you are, uh, continue to do so. But the reason why is because I'm not losing this, right? I am, I am not losing waking up, getting ready, drinking coffee and breakfast. Instead, it's just getting moved up earlier in my day, right? Yeah. And, and, you, and you could say, no, you still get to choose it, uh, chores at some point. But here's the thing, guys, right? Remember how I said at 6 o'clock, you know, I'm going to hang out with my wife and eat dinner? Maybe later in the night I would play games. When do I have to? I mean, these chores have to get done now, right? Now, you know, some of this opportunity cost isn't even in my day. Some of this opportunity cost is even throughout the rest of the day, right? Some of my opportunity cost is, okay, now instead of hanging out with my wife, I have to do the dishes. <clears throat> Maybe instead of, uh, you know, playing games when, you know, she's getting ready for bed and I can still be a nerd, you know, maybe being up a little bit later than I should be. <sighs> you know, maybe instead of getting to do that, I have to, you know, do some other things around the house, right? Maybe because I want to spend time with my wife, I have to give up, you know, playing games or doing work around the house, right? Right? And, and you say, this is why we have the weekend, but Sloth, if I use my whole weekend for doing chores, then that means I can't use my weekend for doing fun things, right? Guys, no matter what you do, opportunity cost exists, right? No matter what you do, opportunity cost exists. No matter what. I hate to say it. I'm sorry. That's the darn honest truth, okay? And, and uh, there was a time during college, like, this made me super anxious. Like, I was super concerned at all times. Like, man, if I'm not doing this, like, I could be doing something else. Like, why am I not doing something else? Like, I had I had really bad FOMO. Right? Fear of missing out. And it wasn't, like, with others, but it was like, man, like, am I using my time the most wise here? Right? Phew! But at some point, you know, I, I realized, okay, well, you know, relaxing has its productive capabilities, right? If I don't relax, I'm not able to, I, I'm not able to be as productive uh, as I otherwise would be. Right? So... There's always a cost, right? There's always a cost. You gotta be careful though. Don't get too swept up in it, okay? Because I, I know uh, when it came to video games, there's a game called RuneScape that I would play a whole lot. And I would always like, oh my gosh. Whenever I'm not playing this game, I'm not earning experience. I'm not earning gold. Everything else is a waste. And I was like, wait a minute. Real life is a waste because I'm not earning experience or gold in RuneScape. That seems a little bit, <laughs> that seems a little bit messed up. Uh, you know, things sound so silly in retrospect, but really, I mean, that's where I was. Phew. Okay. But let's talk about real life. I guess I was talking about real life, but let's talk about something more applicable. Okay. This is, uh, this is Bjorn. Bjorn. Look at that Viking here. Uh, he leads this, uh, this think tank, I don't know if he leads or he was part of, and I don't even see if he's still even involved with him. This clip is from 2007, I think? It's called the Copenhagen Consensus, or the Copenhagen Think Tank. They had the Copenhagen Consensus do that, so. And they had something that really, that really made some people kind of upset in regard to climate change. Here's what he had to say. You may be surprised, because climate control, uh, uh, climate control, lol, not AC. <laughs> Not talking about AC here. Climate change activists were upset with him with what he had to say. Um, so let's let's uh, let's see what he what he had to say, and whether or not what he was saying was denying climate change or anything like that. So I'm gonna put my headphones on and listen along with you. Maybe not. Hello. In 2004, a group of eight economists, including four Nobel laureates, set out to prioritize the world's problems. An ambitious task, to say the least. Prioritizing the world's problem. <laughs> like, I, I, I like how... Um, 
I like how they just he just casually mentioned, yeah, so these guys, they were like, well, let's just solve the world's problems in the best order possible. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, moving on. The group was called the Copenhagen Consensus, and their conclusion basically was, don't waste valuable resources trying to prevent global warming. Focus instead on things like preventing AIDS, alleviating global hunger, and eliminating trade barriers. We're joined today by the organizer of that conference, the self-described skeptical environmentalist, Bjorn Lomberg, author of this book, How to Spend $50 Billion to Make the World a Better Place. Bjorn, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me here. So, it, it, a lot of the criticism that you have uh, occasioned... $50 billion is, is a lot of money, too. To let's make sure we're aware of that. So, let's first deal with that. Um, people look around the world and they see climates getting more extreme, hurricanes increasing, people say the polar ice cap is melting, there does seem to be lots of evidence that global warming is happening, right? Uh, absolutely, uh, and we're not uh, at all disputing that fact. Uh, we got to get into all, the, all the, uh, the niceties of what is actually increasing, but definitely global warming is happening. But right, he's not denying, he's not, he's not denying any sort of you know, warmth of the globe, right? It's not what he's trying to argue, right? What he's arguing is something much more specific. It has a lot to do with opportunity costs. That's why we're watching that right now. The question we ask at the Copenhagen Consensus is not how big are the problems, but how much can we do about them? Essentially, the biggest problem in the world is probably we all die. But since we can't really do something about it, we should focus on some things that we can do something about. We can do something about HIV AIDS. We can do something about malaria, malnutrition, free trade, easily, cheaply and do a lot of good. Wait, but so what it sounds like at some level then is that you're saying you, you have an air of fatalism about it, that if global warming is happening, it's such a huge problem and stopping would be, it would be so immensely costly that it's not worth doing, but what if it ends life on the planet as we know it? Oh, absolutely. Then, then you'd, willing, you'd be willing to spend a lot more. But really, global warming is one of the many problems. What we are saying is two things. First of all, it's not actually going to destroy all life on Earth. Ah, so it will, let's, be, it will so, be a problem. So let's stop at that yes. because okay. lots of scientists say that un, if unchecked, it will actually have a very, very extreme effect on the, you know human life and change uh, places that like Manhattan will be underwater. You've seen the Al Gore movie, I assume. I, I've seen so the what, preview. Yeah. What, what, uh, what do you say to those people who say, look, all the other stuff will be irrelevant? if global warming takes place. Yeah. And that's just simply hype. I mean, when, when uh, uh, Britain's uh, chief scientist, Sir David King, says that we'll only be able in 20, uh, 2100 to live in an ice-free Antarctica because everywhere else is going to be too hot, that's just simply not in the science. If you read the UN climate panel reports, it will get worse some places. Actually, some places it will get better, like where I'm from in Denmark. But most places in the third world, it will get worse but it will not be devastating in any way. You will not see New York inundated. The medium expectations well, wait, Explain is that, because, uh, because people like Gore say that the yes. bulk of scientists believe that places like New York will be underwater. Yeah, and that's just simply wrong, and that's not what the UN... They're getting a little bit off what we're trying to look at within the middle of the video here, but... ...that come together and actually try to describe global warming and in any, as telling... And in any case, again, this is from 2007, with all of the scientific advances that we've had just within the last 10 years, I imagine the, the, the report that he's mentioning is now, inc you know, is now incredibly... I wouldn't say incredibly out of date, but it's probably not the most accurate anymore. And that it, I, I wouldn't take everything that he's mentioning in response to you know climate change not being as big of a deal as it is as, as pure you know gospel. But his idea about opportunity costs. Yes. Let's they keep say listening. somewhere between thirty and fifty centimeters of, of water increase, which would be uh, a foot to two feet of, of water increase over the next century. And you got to remember, last century water actually increased somewhere between 10 and 25 centimeters. So we've already experienced that, and we didn't have big problems. I'm not saying it's not going to be a problem, but I'm saying we've got to look at how big a problem is it. It's not devastation, it's a problem. And the second part, the one that you sort of broke me off in saying, is first of all, it's not going to devastate human, uh, human life. The second part is you also got to ask, how much change can you do? How much can you actually uh, affect this? And the answer is, even if we implement Kyoto, as we've talked about, that is cutting carbon emission about 
for developed countries. Even if the U.S. participated into this, even if all of these countries stuck with the agreement all the way through to 2100, it would do very little good. It would basically postpone global warming for about six years in 2100. Everybody agrees about this. So this is also what the... Don't know if everyone agrees. It's going to be 100% transparent. <laughs> Science tell us. Yet the cost would be about $150 billion a year every year for the rest of the century. So the question I really ask is, do we want to spend a large amount of money, $150 billion every year for the rest of the century, to do very little good 100 years from now? When the UN estimates that for half that amount, for about $75 billion a year, we could solve all major basic problems in the world. We could give clean drinking water, sanitation, basic health care, and education to every single human being on the planet. Yikes. And there's the opportunity cost, right? There's the opportunity cost. Okay. At this point, when this video was created, right, the, the UN estimated that in order to uh, maintain the Kyoto Protocols, that would, you know, uh, by the time we get to 2100, would have uh, pushed back global warming by six years. <laughs> Not that much, right? Still six years, right? Anytime, I'm sure, when you're on your deathbed, any hour would seem, as uh, so long as you're not in pain, you know, writhing in pain would, would seem like a blessing. But um, $150 million a year to push back global warming six years. Or for half that, we could get clean drinking water, education, and food to all those that need it. There's an opportunity cost there, right? There's an opportunity cost there. So, just one example. Again, not denying climate change. Not denying it, but saying there is a cost to it. Right? There is a cost. Uh, and let's go ahead and revisit these guys. They did something similar. They did something similar last year. I want to say in 2019. Do, 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 do. Where are you? Uh, it was... I want to say it was 2019. When was this article published? Can't find. I swore it was 19, but maybe it was 19 targets. Maybe it was 2016? In any case, it was relatively recently, at least compared to this uh, last thing we looked at. But um, they did something similar. They prioritized 19 targets instead of the United Nations 169. And... Uh, it would have an equivalent effect of doubling or tripling the aid uh, that is currently existing. Because they focus on these 169 things instead of these 19 things, uh, everything gets watered down, right? So here's what they said that we, that we should instead focus on. Instead of focusing on, I'm not going to read these 100 plus targets. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and read this article. It's not that long. That's why I'm going to go ahead and just read it. Um, and, and this just demonstrates, again, this whole idea of opportunity cost, right? Should we, you know, we can worry about these 169 things, or we can just worry about doing 19 things really well, okay? And, of course, everyone's opinion is different. So some people may say, well, yeah, I'd much rather us do these 169 things, uh, you know, relatively medi uh, me mediocrely, at a mediocre level, than do these 19 things really well, right? Because I mean, some people value doing all of these things at a mediocre level than doing these things really well, right? So, and that's understandable, right? Shouldn't feel too bad about that. But anyways, let's go. Nobel Laureate's Guide to Smarter Global Targets in 2013. Uh, prioritizing 19 targets instead of the UN's 169 targets is equivalent to doubling or quadrupling foreign aid. Over the past 18 months, we have published 100 plus peer reviewed analyses from 82 of the world's top economists and 44 sector experts, along with many UN agencies and NGOs. These have established how effective 100 plus targets would be in terms of social value for money. An expert panel, including two Nobel laureates, have reviewed this research and identified 19 targets that represent the value represent the best value for money in development over the period 2016 to 2030, offering more than $15 back on every dollar invested. They're taking, essentially, for every dollar that you would donate, they would multiply it to 15 times, okay, with how effective it is being used. In a hurry, download the simple graphic overview here. I'm assuming that's what this is. Anyways, um, in regard, they, they it looks like they separated into three sections, people, planet, prosperity, um, for the people, section they have lower child malnutrition right so getting food to kids 
uh, have malaria infection. That is what Bill Gates is actually involved heavily in. Reduce tuberculosis deaths by 90%. Avoid 1.1 million HIV infections through circumcision. Cut early death from chronic diseases by one-third. Reduce newborn mortality by 70%. Increase immuniz immunization to reduce child deaths by 25%. Make family planning available to everyone. Eliminate violence against women and girls, right? Um, and some of these things, I mean, some of these things, like, they have percentages, but, like, even here, I know there's, like, the science behind this. I, I'm i curious, because I've heard that it, that's not as, I don't know, I've heard that's not as effective as, as people might think. Um, have Okay, that's a ratio. That's a ratio. Uh, this is, I mean, that's 100%. That's a ratio. Eliminate violence, I guess that's a percentage, too, so that's 0%, right? So, I mean, I guess all of these are, you know, in effect, I guess, achievable, uh, and they're measurable. Uh, as far as planning goes, they say phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, this is actually pretty common where governments, because they want to support a, cer a certain sector and because they face competition from more renewable resources, they uh, the government will give money uh, to, uh, to companies that harness fossil fuels. Um, like coal is a, is a good example. Coal's been going out of style just because how... Uh, a, it's not the cleanest, um, and, and B, it's, it's it's not as easy to... I've, I've heard it's not as good as, as other things like natural gas. Um, having coral reef loss, this one... I, I'm curious, we could click on these and see what all their plans are, but I'm curious what this one is. We actually may take a look at that. Um, tax pollution damage from energy. That one's interesting, that uh, the, the dude that was uh, the, the same uh, Copenhagen Consensus... That was, oh yeah, look at that post 2015. The Copenhagen consensus, the same people that were saying that we shouldn't uh, worry too much about global warming are here saying that we should uh, tax pollution uh, damage from energy. I, I'm assuming it, I, I'm assuming that's saying that we should tax uh, carbon emissions. I'm assuming. Well, when I search carbon, it doesn't show up on the page. One should not conflate the energy intensity of the macroeconomy with the energy use of a household firm. I, I, I really... I want opportunities in the energy sector abound globally, especially in emerging markets. Fortunately, from just taking a quick glance, I can't really tell what they're trying to... I'm assuming that's saying uh, carbon emission taxes. Uh, which this is funny because they're saying you know tax the the carbon emissions and and the reason these fossil fuel subsidies exist are because the fossil fuel companies have lobbied the government saying hey because these exist you should give us money back so we can't exist it's a little it's a little silly cut indoor air pollution by twenty percent um, that one's kind of cool prosperity reduce trade restrictions you're always going to see that coming from the Copenhagen consensus they they are economists so they believe in free trade right. Improve gender equality and ownership business and politics. This is globally, mind you, right? Not just the United States. Uh, boost agricultural yield by 40%. Uh, you know, we do this. We make food easier to get, which will probably help a lot with this child malnutrition thing, right? Uh, increase girls' education. Achieve universal primary education in sub-Saharan sub Africa and triple preschool and again, sub-Saharan Africa, right? So uh, you'll notice a lot of sub-Saharan Africa being included in things like this, and you, you got to think, man, uh, you know, what does that have to do with us? I mean, we're thinking, we're talking about the world here, right? And that's a large population of the world, right? Sub Saharan Africa, that's a, that's a large population of the world, right? Um, shoot, you look at, uh, if we were to look at doing, I, I'm not sure what exists in China and India, but if we were to do these same thing, same things in India, I mean, I'd imagine that it would have a similar uh, effect, right? Because I mean, that's where. What, two-thirds of the world's population is? <sighs> Blows my mind. Not two-thirds. Hold on. Uh, what do I want to say? Countries by population. Isn't it something like India? We have, what, three million people? Three billion? It's a trillion? Billion. What's my problem? Thank you. <laughs> uh, three billion people, right? Where's... Yeah, just about. Dang, that's, that just blows my mind every time I look at it. Blows my mind I'm not a third I'm such a silly person what are we up to world population I don't know where I was getting three from I feel like an idiot anyways 
that that just look at this 18 percent. holy moly so yeah i mean if we help out these people places that helps a lot of the world the sad thing is that people really don't want to help china because the chinese government is scary anyways so uh we, we could worry about doing all of those things that you and focuses on or we could just worry about doing those 19 things really well and that would have more of an effect on uh the people of the world and bettering the world than focusing on a lot of things would okay here's another cost we have to talk about okay not just opportunity cost right but here's an idea that all choices involve cost and that's because sometimes those costs aren't on the people that are taking part in the exchange some costs occur some costs occur because they're an externality oh we talked about that word a little bit yesterday when we were when we were talking about uh Milton Friedman's book, Free to Choose, right? So you see, some costs occur because they spill over onto others, right? I think one of the best examples of an externality is, let's say you're, you're, you're breaking down a tree in Minecraft and you realize that you're doing one of those big trees and you realize that there's a piece of wood that you left up there so the leaves aren't going away. What do you do in order to get that wood down? We all do it. We all do it. If there's if there's a if there's a you know a, a, a log left up there and you want to get the trees to start despawning, you take out your dirt and you start jumping and, and you throw it under you. You jump, you throw it under, you jump, you throw it under. You make your one by one tower. You find yourself at the top. You you, you knock out that wood block. You get down from your one by one tower and you walk away. Some people, as Sloth would say, some people would just leave it there, floating in the sky, ruining my immersion. Okay, Nuri, you're saying burn it, but the, the way fire phys the way fire physics work in Minecraft, I sound what what this isn't a science channel. The way that fire works in Minecraft now is that it, it it doesn't spread as easily as it used to, so that may leave some other you know that may leave it there, may not get to it, and that's a, that's an externality, right? Your decision is having a adverse side effect on others, right? It's ruining others' experience because of a transaction that you've, you know, had, had a transaction you've had with the game world, right? In the very same way, if I make a very cool house in Minecraft, then all the other people on that server, when they walk by, they're like, oh, that's a cool house. Man, I like this server. Maybe it's a, a super good example of a positive externality for the server host, right? The server host then gets, you know, maybe more donations for the server. So I was like, yeah, man, there's really cool builders on this server. Of course, you can say the same thing is true for, uh, or the opposite is true for, a ne uh, as, for as far as negative externalities go, right? Someone builds something really dinky on a Minecraft server. I'm not going to stay on this server. All the buildings are really bad and Dungy, Ugh. Ugh. not staying for this. Okay, and then of course I have smoking up here. Smoking is a good example, right? You go into the you go into the 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 gas station on the way by and you know, on the way in you pass some dude just lighting up his his Nicky sticks and doing his best to avoid coughing in the morning, right? And you breathe in that smoke and you say, <laughs> oh, 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 horrible, right? And now you've also just breathed in some carcinogens, maybe unhealthy for you. Right? It's a negative externality. You are having a cost imposed upon you, even though you were not involved in the original deal, the original trade at all, right? And now a lot of people, they, they jump to the conclusion, okay, we need to have the, the government come in and we need to have the government come in and fix this. We gotta be careful though. We gotta be careful because um, we can't say for everybody how much it's costing them, right? It's very hard to quantify, right? So we fix this. I think we're something. We'll, we'll do this by putting taxes on cigarettes. Uh, they're saying, okay, because the because the person uh, that's smoking, they're they're paying the cost of getting the cigarettes, but that's not what it costs society. That dollar amount they pay is not enough. So we're going to put on a tax, right? Uh, Sloth is exactly right, but we got to be careful when we do that, right? Because sometimes we may put a cost on something that uh, we we may make it uh, the the government tax may make it too much, may cost too much, and then. It, it, it all of a sudden artificially costs more than what it costs society, right? So we gotta be very careful, right? There, there's a, there, those are called Peguvian taxes because the economist that came up with them, his name was Pegu, 
can't remember his first name. Really bad with that. I, I can remember their last names, but I can never remember their first names. Uh, but it was Pagu, Paguvian Taxes. And I think even later he came out saying that even, you know, we can't be able to quantify what there should, you know, the, the, the argument for a tax exists, but the idea that humans have enough information as to how much that tax should be for each person, that's very hard to do. And we could actually do more harm than good by trying to use Paguvian taxes. Okay. So, folks, that's all we have for today.